So, good morning, everybody. Um, and first of all, I'd just like to thank the, thank everybody for being here today, and thanks to the capacity team for allowing us to speak and present your work. So, yeah, my title is Investigate the Changes of TJP to Signal with Age so Systems Biology Approach. So, first of all, why examine the TJP Signal Pathway? Well, what I'm most interested in is osteoarthritis. So, osteoarthritis is the most common form of arthritis um, in the UK. Affecting 49% of women and 42% of men aged 75 years and older. So, osteoarthritis development is caused by the breakdown of this cartilage that sits in between the knee and protects bone from running together. As it gets worse, the bone starts to run together, this causes a lot of pain. This can be caused by cartilage degeneration itself or changes in the bone morphology that results in these bony appendages known as osteophytes that can then break down the cartilage themselves and also cause pain. So currently there's no therapies that directly target the disease. Instead we use pain management and change of people's health and their diet and the amount of exercise they do with the eventual end point being total knee replacement. So the reasons that there's no targets for the disease is originally people thought it was a wear and tear type disease that everybody got with age and there wasn't really much we could do about it. Um, a lot more research has been done now we found that there's a genetic component um, injury at different points of life can result, result in development of osteoarthritis. And what I'm most interested in is inflammation seems to be a big driver in the development. So I want to look at pro-inflammatory stimulus, but also more the way of dampening the pro-inflammatory stimulus. So the pro-inflammatory stimulus that I'm looking at is interleukin-1 and oncostatin M. So this is a computer model simulation data that Carol talked about yesterday. So this is the IL-1 in the USM system. So IL-1 itself is a damaging cytokine. It's, it, it, it results in an upregulation of matrix metalloproteinases, MP1, MP13. And these are proteins that directly result in cartilage destruction. Hongostatin M, however, is a bit different. It upregulates a number of different things that protect against, that protect against damage. It results in the upregulation of TIMPs and things such as that. Um, they originally thought that when you put Hongostatin M with IL-1, it would have a protective effect of this IL-1 response. What actually happens is you have a synergistic effect and you're getting a much bigger increase in the upregulation of MMP1 and MMP13. So this is what I want to look at, is if you then add TGF-beta growth factors to this system, you get a dampening of the synergistic response. So here's just here's some experimental results that I have. First of all, I'd like to point out that it's not normalized to basal because in control cells, the levels of MMP are really, really low. So you get quite high fold changes. So instead, I've normalized to the IL-1 and OSM response. And you can see that IL-1 alone gives you a much much bigger reduction in the levels of MP13. And if you add TGF beta with IL-1 and OSM, you get about a 45 to 55% reduction in the expression of MP13. It's worth also pointing out, I also have some data for MP1, but for the sim just for simplicity for this talk and for ease, I'm only going to talk about MP13 from now on. So, TGF beta is a pleiotropic site of A growth factor that has a number of different roles. So, if you add it to bone directly, it results in the, in the build up of these osteophytes that I talked about earlier, so that causes pain and damage to the cartilage. Whereas, in actual cartilage development, it's required. If you block TGF beta signal or remove TGF beta from the cartilage, you get chondrocyte hypertrophy, which are the main cells that make up cartilage, and this results in cartilage degeneration. Um, TGF beta also appears to have a role in protecting against inflammation, as I just showed you before, and this is true for a number of different inflammatory mediators. And finally, as we age, TGF beta's role changes. Instead of being um, an anabolic growth factor, it results in a catabolic growth factor that then, in fact, causes damage. So, this is just, I just wanted to have a look, first of all, at this TGF beta effect over a number of different times. So, these are the same cells, SW cells, which are um, a model of chondrocytes. Um, and at six hours, we can see that the addition of TGF beta has no effect. Same is true at 12 hours. By 24 hours, we get a reduction in the levels of MP13, and then by 48 hours, this reduction is even bigger. So initially, there's a delay, but then it leads to a big, a big level of refreshing by 48 hours. So I just want to move on to a bit and talk a bit more about why TGF beta signaling changes with age. So TGF beta can signal through two type 1 receptors, it can signal through alpha 1 or it can signal through alpha 5. In a young organism, we have a very high level of this alpha 5 receptor with a lower level of alpha 1. So this means the TGF beta preferentially binds to alpha 5 
and down through its downstream signaling pathway leads to the production of matrix components as well as block and chondrocyte hypertrophy and terminal differentiation. As we age, for a reason not yet fully understood, the levels of ALK5 decrease, whereas the levels of ALK1 stay relatively constant and some people argue it even increases. So this leads to TGF beta binding preferentially to ALK1, which in turn leads to matrix breakdown and increased chondrocyte hypertrophy and terminal differentiation. So in STR ORT mice, which are a model of spontaneous osteoarthritis, the Blaney Davison group showed that this change towards ALK1 from ALK5 actually corresponds well with the spontaneous development of osteoarthritis. So this change might be very important in osteoarthritis development. So what we hypothesize is that most likely the immediate repression of MP13 that I showed you earlier is through this ALK5 signal pathway, this protective pathway. So I just have some data that shows this. So we looked first of all at the expression of ALK5 to ALK1 in the cells that we use, and we can see that there's around a 20-fold increase in ALK5. In ALK so what happens if we remove ALK5 from this system? So using SIRNA, we removed ALK5. As you can see, I once again have normalized IL1 and SM. You can see by just adding TGF beta to the cells, we get the 45.5% reduction. If we add a scramble, S a scramble and non-target SIRNA, we see around the same level of repression Whereas if we add siRNA against ALK5, this repression, repressive effect is lost and if anything starts to increase slightly. And this is representative of a number of different experiments and sometimes it increases, sometimes it stays about the same. So I wouldn't want to say that it definitely goes up, but we can certainly say that we lose losing the repressive effect. So what this means is what happens when we age and it moves towards the ALK5 signal. Does this repress, what happens to TGF beta's effect on inflammation? And that's where the modeling comes in. So what I aimed to do was I took two models that Carol had made previously, you know, I modified them to suit what I wanted, and then I've, put them, and then I've combined them two models to, um, to look further at this system. So she created a model of TGF beta signal in which the ALK5 and ALK1 receptors change with age, and this results in different, uh, differential gene expression and the um, movement of what from an anabolic growth factor towards a catabolic growth factor. So the model's in three parts. It's in the ALK5 system, the ALK1 system, and then the IL1 and OSM model, which is the separate model that I've been combining. So I'll just briefly go through the IL1 and OSM model for people who weren't here for Carol's talk yesterday. Um, as you can see, IL1 phosphorylates P38, and it also phosphorylates C um, Jun through Jun. Um, C Jun then binds to other phosphorylated C Juns to form this dimer that can lead to the upregulation of MP38. OSM leads to the, leads to the, product, um, the de novo synthesis of CFOS, which is then phosphorylated by the P38, it's phosphorylated by IL1, and this is what leads to the synergy. The phosphorylated CFOS then binds to the phosphorylated c joint to form a different dimer that lasts for longer in the cell, but also leads to a bigger upregulation in MMP13. So there's a number of different ways in which the TGF beta's pathway might interact with this, but I've just highlighted what we think is the biggest ones at the minute. So through ALK5, TGF beta leads to upregulation of beta's um, joint B, which can interact with both of these dimers to, um, to reduce the levels. Um, but also through ALK1, we lead to an increased phosphorylation of P38, which is so important originally in the IL1 OSM model for the synergistic effect that we see. So, this is some simulation data, and all the simulation data that I've got has been done in Capasi. Um, and this is the model with an active form of TGF beta to best re represent the experiments that I showed you earlier. And so, this is the model with TGF beta, and this is the model without TGF beta. And as you can see, I managed to capture the initial delay that we've seen in the experiments, um, because both of them follow the same path at the beginning. It then leads to a decrease in MMP13 expression towards the later time points. One thing I will point out is at the minute, I still haven't managed to get the level of repression that we've seen in the experiments, especially by 48 hours where you can see it's around the same as 24, whereas in the experiments it was much more. So this suggests that at the minute there's still something missing from the model that we have to find. Regard regardless of that, the model's still being quite interesting in that the only way we can get this level of repression is with de novo synthesis of proteins. So originally we thought it might be that there was um, some interaction between the SMADs and um, the AP1 complexes that lead the upregulation of MP13. But if I put this into the model, it's impossible to get the delay that we see here. So this suggests that we need new protein synthesis in order to get the repressive effect that we've seen. 
So, th so this was done to represent the experiments, but what I want to look at mainly is if I have an inactive form of TGF-beta, so how TGF-beta is in the knee is it's formed, it's, there's large quantities of an in a latent form, this is then activated and then results in the regulation of the TGF-beta pathway. So if I represent this in the model by having latent forms of TGF-beta that can be activated and slowly progress over a number of months, and then I introduce IL-1 and OSM as events at different time points, we can see what changes. So the green bar represents ALP5 levels and these decrease slowly and the pink bar represents ALP1 and even though these decrease slowly, they stay relatively constant throughout the model, eventually resulting in ALP1 being higher than ALP5. So if we trigger these events at different time points and different ALP1, ALP5 ratios, we see that in the earliest one, at four months, we get this big repressive effect and also what's very important is that MMP13 appears to leave the system or at least get much lower in the system earlier. If we move to a slightly later time point when the ALP1 is only marginally above ALP5, we can see that there's still a repressive effect, but it's much less than before. Again, MMP13 leaves the system quicker. But if we go to the final time point when ALP1 is much higher than ALP5 at around 19 months, we can see the repressive effect is still there, but it's almost entirely gone, and MMP13 leaves the system around about the same rate as it does. Um, without TGF beta present. This result was particularly interesting because it wasn't quite what we were expecting. We were expecting that MMP13 would go up even more when it moved through the ALP1 because of the phosphorylation of P38 and also because we thought we'd totally lose the press effects so would just be added in. In fact, TGF beta results in MMP13 regulation by itself, so we thought with the stimulus we'd just be even further. Um, so this result is particularly interesting and one that we'd like to test. Um, like I said, the model still needs some work, so if this is still there, when the model is complete, it will be very interesting to we'll take a look more in there. So my future work is to improve the model to better represent the experimental data that I have and some other experimental data that I have. Um, then I'd like to make some testable predictions about how the TGF beta repressive effect is mediated. Um, I'd then like to go on to test these effect, test these, and make sure we're, that any predictions that the model makes is true before I go on any further. Once I'm confident in the model, I want to use it to be able to test for potential therapies um, that reverse the change in TGF beta repression in the age. I want to look at not only where to target, but what's the best time to target as well. So that's where I want to um, acknowledgements is um, that Dr. has hated um, Professor Drew Rowan and Professor Francesca Falsini as my Liverpool supervisor, the model and group, most of which are here, and the MRG group, which I did most of the experiments. Thank you.